Jensen co-founded NVIDIA in 1993 at the ripe old age of 30 and is known for his trans his transforming AI and building the gaming market into the largest entertainment industry in the world today. His keen ability to identify changes and opportunities in next generation technologies has made NVIDIA the leader of the computing industry. Fortune magazine credited NVIDIA's success to Jensen's leadership, stating NVIDIA's culture is the product of a founder CEO who embraces community, strategic alignment, and a core value system that promotes the pursuit of excellence through intellectual honesty. Jensen's accomplish accomplishments and influences on AI, AI have been nationally recognized. He is the recipient of the Dr. Morris Chang Exemplary Leadership Award and holds honorary degrees from Taiwan's National Chow Tung University and Oregon State University. He was named Fortune's Business Person of the Year in 2017, and in 2018, Harvard Business Review ranked him number two on its list of the world's best performing CEOs over the lifetime of their tenure. He holds a BS degree from Oregon State University and an MS degree from Stanford, both in electrical engineering. And on a personal note, I would like to thank Jensen and all of his team from NVIDIA for their support, mentorship, and inspiration as we design this building, the supercomputer upstairs, and our AI-focused computer science degree. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to NVIDIA President and CEO, Jensen Wang. Thank you, Dr. Walls, for that very generous welcome. Uh, as I was sitting there, I met a couple of new friends, uh, Kagan and Juan, and they, reached, they looked over to me and says, and who are you? <laughs> and that's how my morning starts, usually. <laughs> Keeping your feet to the ground is... is uh, one of the core tenets of success. Uh, today I want to talk about three things. First of all, it's, it's a great honor to be here. This is a mag magnificent building. I want to congratulate Dwight and Diane and Dr. Walls and all of the students that are going to be able to benefit from this amazing building, the collaboration spaces, the supercomputer upstairs. You know, one of the, one of the great visionary things that was done here and, uh, and Dwight did, did something really amazing. Not only did he put a building in place, but he installed the single most important instrument of knowledge today inside this building, a supercomputer. Uh, very few people, uh, very few students who are not in graduate school or working in large research institutions get access to technology like that. And yet, in today's world, without access to the necessary instruments, it's hard to pursue knowledge. And, um, and so now you have the ultimate instrument of knowledge discovery right here in this building, and, and I congratulate you for that. Uh, it's, also, it's also a great honor to give the inaugural speech in the NVIDIA Auditorium. And um, my first speech uh, in this, well, the first speech in this auditorium, my first speech in Milwaukee. Uh, I, understand, I understand that um, uh, going to school here is, is really fantastic. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, a richness of sausages. Uh, <laughs> uh, cheese that speaks back to you when you, when you, bite, when you bite into it. And I, I understand that because all of these buildings used to be breweries, uh, beer runs uh, from the tap. <laughs> and so, so I've, I've been turning on all the, all the taps. So far, no luck. I'm going to talk about three things today. I'll, I'll, um, my, my talk will be broken into three sections, and, and then we'll open it up for, for, uh, for questions. Uh, I'll talk about our beginning, uh, our humble beginnings, uh, most, most of it so that I can show some pictures of Dwight, and um, I, how we started, uh, what, what great vision we had, uh, grand dreams that we had, um, and then the second part will be our body of work, uh, what we've accomplished through the last quarter of a century. Uh, in that process, hopefully, uh, I'll convey uh, adequately uh, some, of the, some, of the, um, uh, some of the great challenges and learnings that we had 
uh, along the way that I think are essential to success. And then um, I'll close with uh, talking about uh, what lies ahead, what we're so excited about the future. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the beginning. Uh, uh, this is Chris. Chris is right there. Um, he, uh, I have, I have to say that, that he he um, he aged um, very gracefully because look how attractive of a man he is today. Uh, Dwight still has that shirt. Now, you could tell that Dwight is the software engineer because he was the only person in our company with a PC. <laughs> I, I had an abacus on my desk. You see, my mom and dad gave me an abacus because that's about all the precision necessary uh, to do, to do uh, my work. Um, I had uh, pieces of notes that, that described our company's strategies, and um, I used to carry a briefcase. Uh, and then we had a phone, and no one called. <laughs> and that was the last time I saw Chris wear a tie. The, uh, uh, this, company, this company was our first customer, Gateway 2000. Uh, they're no longer here. And um, I, Dwight's office is still that messy. <laughs> this is, that's one of the skills that MSOE did not teach. <laughs> Organization was, was a, apparently not one of the skills that was passed along here. Um, uh, but but um, uh, that's how we started. This, this was 1993, and uh, Dwight was in his mid-20s, I, I was uh, 30. Uh, Chris is not much older. He's only a couple of years older than I am. And, and the, 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 the small team of us, uh, Dwight's employee number 22, um, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, compensation was largely equity, uh, which, which meant at the time uh, valueless uh, pieces of paper. Uh, and and uh, it was valueless, but we had still had to set the set a value on it. And so his stock option price uh, was uh, uh, five cents, a nickel. Um, and uh, that was uh, split 12 times uh, since. So, so um, uh, one twelfth of a nickel <laughs> is what uh, uh, Dr. Dierks um, buys NVIDIA stock at today. And uh, so it, it's quite a loss for our company. Every time he sells a share of stock, uh, $185 come out of our treasury. Um, and so, so uh, please hold on to everything you have. Uh, but but uh, when he started, our company had a valuation of zero, zero billion dollars. And uh, it remained zero billion dollars for well over a decade. And, um, uh, and we raised, we raised $2 million uh, as our first round uh, just, just prior to him joining. And our, our post-valuation, what, what venture capitalists describe as post-valuation, which is what is the value of the company after they put the money in, uh, the post-value uh, uh, market value of our company was $6 million. $6 million. So, so uh, today, uh, NVIDIA is um, uh, the 50th most, most valuable company in the S&P 500 and um, uh, with a valuation of $115 uh, billion. And so $115 billion, uh, $6 million, uh, that, that was, that was, the, that was the, um, the value that Dwight and the rest of the company built. And, but those are, those are, those are um, uh, important uh, simply as a way of keeping score. Um, however, uh, so that someday uh, an incredible gesture like this uh, could happen. 
And um, uh, Dwight made an incredible grand gesture here. And this is a magnificent building. And this is the way to pass it forward. And, and so I'm very proud of what he's done here. And uh, a lot of it is made possible uh, because of our amazing colleagues and the work that we did together. And so this is the beginning. This is shortly after. Um, this is uh, the, Rob Chunger is also in, in, the, in the audience. Um, uh, he's the guy wearing the, where's Rob? Rob was here earlier. Where's Rob? He's in the atrium. He's in the atrium. They won't let him in? <laughs> Tier two. There he is, right there. He's in the atrium. So that's, that's him. And um, uh, Dwight was, was our acting CFO. And um, the reason for that was because, because uh, our company was, was constantly threatening to go out of business. And the work that we were doing uh, was so unsuccessful in the early days uh, that we had a hard time retaining CFOs. And the reason why we had a hard time retaining CFOs is because CFOs knew better. <laughs> and they could see the numbers. And so, so uh, they, they, realized, they realized the peril we were in, uh, the harm's way the company was, was in, and, and uh, we had a hard time keeping CFOs. And, and so Dwight, Dwight said, we don't need a CFO, okay? And he, he's good with math, and um, <laughs> uh, he, he wanted to be our act. He says, I got it under control. So he was our acting CFO. Uh, this, is, this is Dwight and I uh, in, uh, in India, opening up our India office. This is, this is of course, many years later. I just wanted to, to, sh to show that what Dwight is willing to do for his employees. Most, most, of, the, most of our employees in India uh, report into Dwight. We have 14,000 employees today. Uh, about 4,000, 4,500 4, of those employees, most all of the software engineers in our company report to Dwight. He has, he has the largest span of control of any executive in our company. We have 20, uh, I have, I, have uh, uh, I heard somebody said something about cabinet. My cabinet, my what we call executive staff, has 26 members. And uh, Dwight uh, has a third of our employees under his watch. So you gotta ask yourself, what are the other 25 people doing? <laughs> but, We laugh like this at work all the time. The fact that we're, we're still in business is a miracle to all of us. It's not, not just you. And so, so um, uh, this is Dwight, and, and, uh, and we were opening up the ceremony, and, and he, he is just a, such a great sport. Uh, they, they, uh, he, he is basically the boss of all of the employees in, in India, and he visits, he visits India more than, more than anybody. And um, as you know, you know, he occupies a lot of space, and so even first class is barely big enough for him. The, and he makes that trip several times a year, and it's, it's quite a journey, and he visits all over India. Um, they, they, put out, they put out the red carpet for him, and, and, uh, but it's, it's really quite a, quite a trip. And, um, and, and so anyways, uh, Dwight and I have been, through, been, been to uh, places uh, far and wide, and it's, it's really um, been a great journey uh, getting here. This is, this is where we started the company. This is the, the, um, uh, the townhouse we're in. Uh, it, it's just, it was just put up for sale, and, um, and this is how they're marketing this, this uh, townhouse. It all started 25 years ago, you know, it, it, dot, 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 like, kind of like Star Wars. In January 1993, the three founders of NVIDIA started the company in this townhouse. And so that's how, that's how this townhouse is being marketed. It's going for $750,000 26 years later. So, so Chris, I think this, this townhouse was probably worth about a, like a trailer home at the time. But it was about that size. The no three, air no air conditioning. Uh, and so I had the living room. I programmed the, the, uh, the telephone I said, I recorded, uh, you know, thanks for calling the uh, world headquarters of NVIDIA. And um, I, I, wish, I wish we had saved all the recordings because I, I don't think we got any. No one called. Absolutely no one called us. And so this is what happens when you start a company. Uh, nobody know you exist. Nobody cares that you exist. And, uh, um, and, and there's just this, this, uh, this complete silence. 
kind of like that. <laughs> and, and so, and so that's what happens. Uh, this is what it's, that's what a day's like. A day is like that. And, and what I mean by that is, is, is now it's, it's incumbent upon you to create something from nothing. To create something from nothing. Absolute silence. Imagine having no emails. No one writes. You have no action items. There's nothing on your calendar. I used to nap at work. I still nap at work. We would go out for two, three hour lunches. There was nothing to do. <laughs> Nobody called. You have no one to call. Uh, we just, I think largely, Chris, we just wanted to leave home and make sure that our wives thought we were working. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we uh, spent a lot of time in arcades playing video games. And then we would go home. That would be a solid day. <laughs> but the, 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 the moral of that story is, imagine starting something from nothing. It's just a blank sheet of paper. What do you do? How do you start? What's the first step? What is that grand big idea? Well, our big idea was, was uh, turned out to have been rather profound. We observed that, that uh, at the time, Windows 3.1 had just come out and the personal computer revolution was just barely getting started and hasn't gotten started yet. But we imagined that if we could find a way to make 3D graphics consumerized so that a large number of people can gain access to this technology, that it would become a medium for artistic expression and enable a brand new industry that didn't exist at the time called video games. That this technology, if somehow democratized, could enable a brand new industry. But secondly, what was even more profound than that was that this technology and the company that led its development, and if that company were to make it possible, may someday be one of the world's most important technology companies. And the reason for that is because 3D graphics were largely expressed as the simulation of reality, the simulation of worlds, is so complex, it's a never-ending challenge. If we knew how to create virtual reality as we know it, so that we can't tell the difference between real and not real, that journey must be long to replace the laws of physics in everything we do and to bring artificial intelligence into a world that is art otherwise non-existent must be one of the world's great computational challenges. And the technology that it spins off along the way could solve amazing problems. That's what those guys were talking about over long lunches, beers at three, <laughs> between naps. The imagination of this world. And it turns out, great dreams start like that. What if we were able to do something like that? What if that amazing something that otherwise would not have been possible, we made possible? What if we undertook the world's grand challenges. And when you're sitting there like that with a few people in the room, it sounds utterly ridiculous. But you have to find a way to get your brain to get past that. Because if somebody else could do it, why can't you? That simple logic, that simple sensibility allows people with absolutely nothing to work with to build great things. Today, NVIDIA looks like this. This is two of our 
20 some odd buildings. There are 14,000 employees. As I mentioned, we're one of the largest companies in the world. We're the 50th most valuable company in the United States. But what gives me great pride is the body of work that we have done and the work that we're doing today. The amazing thing about this is um, we started from nothing, and, and even as I look at our company today, it, it still slightly baffles my mind because I remember having nothing. And the question, the question that people ask me is, is um, what matters? Well, vision matters, strategy matters, the ability to connect a vision to a strategy, set of strategies matter. Uh, execution of those strategies matter. You can't execute strategies without great people. You can't have amazing vision without imaginary people. So people matter. The operating system of a large group of people working on something very complicated called culture surely matter, and it does. A sense of customer focus matters. Having customers really matters. <laughs> cash matters. I remember hearing cash is king. Sure, yeah, cash is king. Ideas are king. Vision's queen. We got emperors of all kinds of things. Everything matters, as it turns out. And so the question is, is um, uh, from my perspective, what mattered most? We had... We competed with Silicon Graphics. If you go up, this, uh, up that road over there, um, where Google is today, buildings after buildings after buildings on 101. Uh, I used to drive to that little tiny townhouse where uh, Chris and Curtis were waiting for me. Uh, and um, I would drive past uh, Silicon Graphics and some microsystems and buildings and buildings and buildings and buildings and buildings. And then I get to my townhouse uh, where nobody called and there's no computers and nobody cares to talk to us. Um, we competed with Silicon Graphics, some microsystems, IBM, Intel, some of the world's largest companies. We competed with some nearly 100 different startups. By the time that we thought it was a great idea and we got the company off the ground slightly, everybody else thought it was a great idea as well. So why would one company with a handful of people become the only computer graphics company in the world today stand alone and the largest computer graphics company in the history of the industry. How does that happen? Every single morning we woke up, there's a brand new press release from another company that just launched a product. We were shot at from every single direction. Unlike basketball, they let more than one team on the court at the same time. <laughs> It's chaos out there, and there are very few rules. Every team has different number of people. The only thing I remember, we had the fewest. And so the question is, what mattered? There are several things that really stand out uh, for me. Uh, one of them is your perspective of the meaning of your work really matters. The meaning of your work, the purpose of your work, really matters. Some people were just trying to make a fast graphics chip. Some people were trying to make an industry standard something, or rather. Some, some people just wanted to make consumer video games. We had a perspective about our company and about our industry that was greater than that. The second is to truly understand the dynamics of your industry. Our industry dynamics if we were to be successful in creating it, creating it would surely be different than other industries' dynamics. We always thought from first principles. Instead of looking at somebody else's business book or somebody else's business plan or looking at some other industry and importing their ideas, we always started from first principles. How should our industry behave if we were to create it today? Thinking from first principles was really effective for us. I used to remember customers telling us that the average selling price of a product in our, in our space, a graphics chip, is something like, you know, pick your number, $28. And I used to tell them that 
our cost is $48 and our price is going to be higher than that. And our customers would tell us we're not interested in that product. But we believed it for some reason. We had a fundamental core belief about the future of this industry and we followed our belief against the input of others. And so when our customers told us they weren't interested, we built it anyways. We risked our entire company and we built it anyways. And the reason for that is because we believed it. We believed that if we built it, they might not come. But if we don't build it, they can't come. We can't invent this new world if someone doesn't break the rules about it. If somebody doesn't innovate, if somebody doesn't take a chance, the world can't change. Following conventional wisdom is not the best way to invent a great new future. And so we believed in what we believed, and we followed our belief. Even in the way that we worked, we were on the, on the balance of going out of business. Our first two generations of products didn't work out. We had invented a technology that we thought, we invented a technology we thought was going to be groundbreaking, and it turned out not to work at all. NV1 and NV2, we thought, was going to change everything. We had poured our hearts and souls into it, as Dwight would remember and Chris would remember for quite well. And in the final analysis, it didn't work not even a little bit. We were supposed to go out of business. And so we decided we would change course. We realized that it wasn't going to work. We realized why we did, took the risk. And we've changed our course over the course of a weekend. And then we realized there was not enough time to build this new product because we just didn't have enough money in the bank. And so we decided to this. We decided that we can't build this new product the way that the industry builds products in the past. That we have to build it in a new way. And in order to build it in a new way, we had to buy this incredible instrument called an emulator. And in fact, there was another company that built an emulator and they were going out of business because nobody else bought emulators. And so we decided to buy the emulator from a company that tried to sell, sell an emulator and failed and were going out of business. We took half of our money in the bank and we bought an emulator from a company going out of business. Nobody would do that. But we believed it was the right thing to do. That emulation system allowed us to do things today like nobody else can do. We evaluated from first principles, we believed in it, and we followed our beliefs. The ability to follow your beliefs, believe in what you believe, and had the conviction, the courage of conviction is one of the things I most admire, admire, admire about our company. And it's made it possible for us to invent or in, reinvent our company and reinvent our industry over and over again. We invented the modern, we invented the GPU, we invented programmable shading. We are the ones that made video games as beautiful as they are. We invented CUDA, which turned the GPU into a simulator of virtual reality. We then used that technology to reinvent supercomputing, which is now powering the supercomputer upstairs. It allowed us to discover artificial intelligence, and now we're in the process of reinventing our company and the industry yet again. The ability to follow your belief, the courage of conviction, and to really act on it is something that I find really rare in people. A lot of people will believe something but not act on it. Or believe something, want to act on it, but it just hurts too much. Suffering is a word that we use with great pleasure in our company. Because the journey includes a lot of suffering. In order to do something great, in order to do something for the very first time, a lot of suffering is involved. And there's a lot of suffering in the work that we do. Suffering not in the traditional way this is suffering. Suffering as in, in suffering in, in doing something it didn't work out. Doing something is embarrassing. Doing something, we have to relearn it. 
and do it all over again. Doing something, wasting time. Doing something, wasting money. Suffering along the way. Most of it, embarrassment. Some of it, loss of time and money. And some of it, losing entire businesses altogether. And so suffering is one of the things that, that um, I think are essential to building great things, and it's essential to building great companies. So chapter one, NVIDIA is now a very large company with lots of scale. Our body of work consists of three large areas. One, computer graphics. A lot of the computer graphics technology that people see today, the way you design cars, make movies, play video games, all of that is made possible because of some fundamental inventions that we made along the way. Computer graphics is one large body of work. If you look at the upper left, that's where we started. That's the first image our company ever created. 1994, it's called Sega's Virtual Fighter. It is uh, not very realistic. It looks like a cartoon. And on the upper right is an image we generated recently. Photorealistic, using fundamentally different technologies. The difference between the two in terms of computational capability is several million times more powerful. And so just imagine at the time in 1993 building a product that does the upper left and imagining that you would create a product that does the upper right. And along the way, our R&D budget went from a few million dollars to now five billion dollars every generation. Unbelievable journey. We invented the GPU, we invented ray tracing recently, and um, we're gonna show it to you. I think that, hey Paul, how do I do this? Do I just, do I just click? Should I just click? Okay. And so this is, um, this, is, this is a short little video that shows you what ray tracing can do today and why it's so profound. We're basically simulating the physics of light and how it uh, moves around the environment as it's absorbed, reflected, and refracted uh, on the various surfaces. So take a look. We're thrilled to announce that ray tracing is coming to Minecraft. Together with the Minecraft development team, we've implemented from the ground up a state-of-the-art path tracer. To showcase this technology to its full potential, we've added a physically based material pipeline to Minecraft. We're excited to see what realistic environments creators can come up with. Path tracing simulates light as you might expect to see it in reality. A good example would be global illumination. You see how the light enters through the window, bounces off the ground and illuminates almost the entire room. Because we're simulating individual rays of light, color mixing occurs just as it would in reality. Now with ray tracing, we can simulate complex light interactions with transparent objects, such as refractions and reflections. One of the features we're really excited about is per pixel emissus. We can light things in the scene based off of textures. Varying levels of roughness allows us to demonstrate different levels of reflectivity depending on the material on screen. Micro facets in the surface of an object describe how rough it is, such as smoothed gold or polished metal. Ray tracing is going to take this to the next level, and we're really excited to see what the Minecraft creator community is going to do with this once it becomes available. So that's ray tracing. The, the body of work that we've done, we've contributed in the computer graphics industry, and the the, the work that we've done to elevate the industries is just is so great and I'm so proud of it. Um, about a decade and a half ago, we came to the conclusion that in order to uh, create amazing worlds, the first thing that we have to do is simulate it. And the laws of simulation, the laws of physics, is a supercomputing problem. It's a scientific computing problem. So there's, there's a question for us is how do we take a supercomputer and shrink it into something that fits inside a computer so that you could simulate it before you generate the images? And that led us into the world of programmable GPUs. It was a gigantic, gigantic bet. Just to put it in perspective, it took us about uh, three to four years to invent the technology and then came the bad news on the day that we realized it was going to work. The bad news is that it would incur, it would 
nearly double the cost of our products. It would double the products, the, the double the cost of our products on every one of our products, and we were already a multi-billion dollar company at the time. Now, doubling the cost of a product is fine if a customer saw additional value. But on the day that we introduced that technology, there were no applications for it. So the customer received no benefit while your cost increased. So the only way we could get that product to market, that technology to market, was to increase our cost without changing our price. Well, we're a public company. I spoke to the board about that, but the importance of the work that we're going to do, and we decided we would increase the cost across our entire product line because it's a computer architecture, and a computer architecture has to work in all of the computers that an application developer were to find that architecture in. And people ask me again, Jensen, if you built it, they might not come. How would you know the application developers would come? And my counter is, again, we believe in what we believe. We believe this is the right answer. And if we don't build it, they can't come. And so we decided to unleash this technology into our product line. It's called CUDA. CUDA has gone on to revolutionize computer science. But during that time, our profits got destroyed. Our P&L was pulverized. NVIDIA stock price dropped to $1.50 today's trade. And it did so for about half a decade. And we hung on and we explained, we hung on, we explained, and we just kept on powering through. We promoted, evangelized, taught, wrote books, developed applications all over the world. And then, magically, supercomputing centers realized what we were saying was true. That in order for computers to continue to evolve and advance, it needed a technology like ours. Our nation selected our GPUs to power a Oak Ridge and the Oak Ridge Open Science Supercomputing Center uh, to power its supercomputer. And researchers all over the world started to adopt this technology in one application after another, one field of science after another from molecular dynamics, computational physics, astrophysics, particle physics, high energy physics, all of these t different types of fields of science started to adopt our technology because it was the best way going forward. And we're just so incredibly proud of this contribution. Uh, last year, or two years ago, the Nobel Prize winning physics and the no Nobel Prize winning chemistry uh, were both made possible because of the work that we did. The LIGO laser interferometer uh, gravitational wave observatory to prove that, to observe ex experimentally that Einstein was right, that gravity is a warp in space and time. And if it's a warp in space and time when large massive objects collide, it should send shock waves. And those shock waves, gravitational shock waves, we should be able to observe. LIGO was able to observe shock waves of gravitational waves a hundred years after Einstein predicted it. Cryo-EM, the ability to see biomolecular structures so accurately that we can now understand the operations of the biomolecular machine made possible because of the work that we did. The Cryo-EM machines are all powered by NVIDIA GPUs. And so this field of work enabled us to make a contribution to science and knowledge discovery in a way that we, po we couldn't possibly imagine. However, the technology also powers video games because fluid dynamics is the same fluid dynamics that we experience with boats that are, that are traveling on oceans or particle physics and explosions, buildings crumbling. All of those type of effects are the same effects that we observe in scientific computing. It's the same laws of physics. And so we, we were able to envision this future of computing and the type of applications that we would like to enable, and we had the courage of conviction to go pursue it. That led us to something really quite remarkable. We discovered that in the future, almost all instruments will be computational instruments. And in fact, one of my favorite instruments 
uh, was um, discovered uh, seven years ago, and it's called deep learning. Deep learning is an algorithm that writes algorithms that no humans can write. And I'm going to come back and talk about this in just a moment. But since then, since, since seven years ago, and the work that we did, we've enabled the artificial intelligence in the industry to really flourish in a way that nobody could have imagined. And we start off a shockwave of technology advancements that now people call the AI revolution. We were at the epicenter of that moment, and some of the decisions that we made came back and really made a difference in how this industry evolved. And I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a second. That led us to some of the funnest works that we've done. Uh, one of the, the president of G Healthcare is here. Um, Michael Barber is here. And he created the GE revolution. We were incredibly privileged to have been part of that project. Um, in working on that project, using mathematics and high-performance computing, G was able to reduce the dosage of CT by nearly 90% and still get the same resolution that was possible without. Reducing the dose of CT makes it possible for more people to be able to use that technology to image and pre-diagnose uh, conditions. And so the ability for us to use computational sciences to replace brute force imaging is now going to permeate instruments of all kinds all over the world. You just saw how we used it for LIGO, we used it for cryo-EM, we're using it for CT. Now imagine all of the instruments that we know in the future being powered computationally using mathematics. We've recently applied it, artificial intelligence to that so that we can exceed even the limits of what reasonably the signals should be able to do. And so artificial intelligence is going to take us to the next level of computational instruments. It led us to be able to start working on areas called robotics because we've now been able to solve perception challenges, reasoning challenges, and path planning challenges. Let me show you one little example. This is our work in robotics. Basically, a robot has to do several things. It has to perceive the environment through various sensors, fuse the input of, we call it sensor fusion, proceed from that, reason about what the circumstances are, and plan the path, make a plan of actions. Perception, reasoning, path planning are the fundamental blocks, if you will, computational steps, if you will, of artificial intelligence. Teaching a virtual reality robot how to dance. Articulation, these are all works from NVIDIA's research. Teaching a robot in simulation how to be a robot and then taking that neural network brain and putting it to a real robot and the robot does the same thing. Teaching a robot how to be a and then creating the computers to go run it. I'm super excited with the work that we're doing in robotics. And it's led us to one particular area in robotics that I think will make a great impact, and that's self-driving cars. I'm going to show you one more video here of our self-driving car work. And again, a self-driving car has to use multiple sensors, perceive from it, reason about where it's at, where all of the other surrounding agents are at, predict where they're going to be, and then plan a safe path to the destination you're trying to get to. What I just described is the algorithm of a self-driving car. Everything has to happen, of course, in real time. We believe that everything, that's, everything that moves will eventually be autonomous. Whether there be autonomous with human in the loop, or if they're in applications where
driven by software running on top of a supercomputer that fits in the car, and that supercomputer is exactly like the one upstairs, except it's just a lot smaller. And this, this supercomputing software is basically doing the robotics loop that I just described before, perception reasoning and path planning. And so that's it. That's, um, that's NVIDIA's body of work today. And you can see it started from computer graphics on the upper left. And just take a look at our journey. You know, in literally our lifetime, this is our body of work. When Dwight and I started working together and Chris and I started working together, we're looking at, we're creating images that are in the upper left. And today we have self-driving cars and robots and supercomputers discovering knowledge and artificial intelligence that we're working on. It's really, tr truly been a, a remarkable journey. And so some of the things that, that um, uh, we're excited about now, if you take a look at this body of work and, you, and our company's contribution our unique contribution is to build computers that can solve problems that normal computers cannot. That's what NVIDIA does for a living. We build computers to solve problems that normal computers cannot. We build computers for the Da Vinci's of our time, for the Einstein's of our time, to, do, to go discover new knowledge to solve problems that otherwise are impossible. And we avoid projects that normal computers can. If other companies could do it, if a whole lot of problems have already been solved, we will avoid those projects. And the reason why we avoid those projects is because we believe it squanders the lives of the amazing computer scientists that come work at our company. A company's fundamental purpose is to enable its people to do their life's work and nobody wants to do the life's work that's already been done. And so we create the conditions by which amazing people can come to our company, a platform by which they could do their life's work, the scale, their colleagues, the resources of our company, the expertise of our company, so that we can go tackle the world's greatest challenges. And I'm just incredibly proud of the work that we've done so far. Now, it led us to the discovery of modern artificial intelligence. Modern art artificial intelligence, you're experiencing already. Whenever you s say something to your phone, whenever you look for something on the web, whenever it recommends a movie or a place to go for a restaurant, whenever it matches drivers and riders, artificial intelligence is involved in that process. No humans could write that software. The scale of that software, the complexity of that software is so great, it is simply not possible to write. And so we use a technology called machine learning. Machine learning basically is an algorithm that processes an enormous amount of data, historical data, and it finds interesting features and patterns by itself. I've just described something that we do normally, humans do normally. We look at previous experiences, life experiences. We observe patterns that repeat we generalize those observations into knowledge, and then we can apply it to predict the future. Artificial intelligence is a computer doing that, studying from gigantic amounts of data, processing the data, discovering patterns, and then using that discovery to write new software. So artificial intelligence is a computer that writes software. It's software that writes software. It's software that writes software that no humans can write because it is too complex. The software that was enabled as a result of uh, the work that was done about seven, eight years ago in deep learning has now achieved superhuman levels. We can now achieve superhuman levels in image recognition, flowers of all kinds, animals of all kinds, it is just not possible for a human to have the visual vocabulary of an artificial intelligence. We can now achieve speech recognition at superhuman levels. One of the groundbreaking work that's been done recently is speech recognition, but natural language understanding. What is meant by the words said? And if you could understand that, you combine it with what we've already solved, 
then the conversational AI is right around the corner. You're going to be able to have a conversation with a computer, tell it what to do or have a conversation with it. It will understand what you meant and they can go perform and act on that. Conversational AI is just around the corner. The first part of our journey in AI was to build fundamentally the new computer necessary to create AI. And that's the computer that you have upstairs in this building. We call it DGX. The processing technology is called Tensor Cores. The entire computer has been reinvented in how it processes information. We reinvented the processor, reinvented the computer, reinvented the software stack that goes on top of it, and the methodology of developing the software. The first users of it were the cloud providers. And the reason for that is because they have enormous amount of data, they have a lot of computer scientists, but most importantly, because the applications that they're using it for are not life critical. If they were to make a recommendation about pizza and it wasn't exactly right, no harm will come to us. If they made a recommendation about a movie to watch, no harm will come to us. If they did speech recognition poorly, we might be a little irritated, but no harm will come to us. If they tagged our photo album, not perfectly, we will be a little irritated, but no harm will come to us. Artificial intelligence had the benefit of being incubated, if you will, in consumer internet applications. That incubation process is moving at very high speeds. And the reason for that is because those industries are very large. Now it's in the process of going into the next two phases of AI, which I'm incredibly excited about. The first one is what we call AI at the edge. It's basically turning everything in the world into an iPhone. Everything that's a machine will turn into an iPhone. Uh, every camera in the world, every microphone in the world, every sensor in the world, every architect, uh, agriculture instrument, every machine, every elevator will be connected through IoT into a large web, connected web of machines. And every maker of those instruments, every owner of buildings will basically run large services that are going to be augmented by the power of AI. The benefit, of course, is to remove waste, to not waste energy where it's not necessary, to predict when something is about to fail, and to be able to do that at a very large scale, AI at the edge. The next part of it is autonomous AI. The AI will li literally be in a machine and it will operate by itself in our environment, collaborating with us, what we call cobots, moving things for us, autonomous vehicles, and they'll be among us uh, all over the world. And so these four eras of AI, each has its own fundamental technology that has to be invented. And that's why when, you, when I showed you our body of work, you see that we're exploring each one of these phases long before the market is ready for it, so that we could discover the technology, discover how it's gonna be used, invent the unnecessary inventions um, along the way. And so AI is now literally in all aspects of industry, from the internet companies, the computer companies, and now moving out into the industrial companies, transportation companies, healthcare companies, all over. And this is, this is an area that we're incredibly excited about, and we think it's going to be one of the most powerful forces that we have ever seen in technology. One of the, one of the best observations has to do with the fact that, that um, AI is, somebody calls it the fourth industrial revolution. And when, you, when I say it this way, um, it's, it's really quite tremendous. The first industrial revolution automated power. It turned uh, steam, steam power into mechanical power, it automated power, automated mechanical energy. The second, automated electricity. It distributed electricity all over the place. And so it made it possible for us to enjoy the benefit of energy everywhere. The third was the invention of digital technology. We automated information transfer. I can send you an email, you could store a file, we could retrieve it, we could share information, automate information transfer. This one is super exciting because this is the automation of automation.
AI is the automation of automation. The first one is automation of power, automation of energy, automation of information, and now this is the automation of automation. Software will write software. Machines will learn. And these machines and these computers will augment and accelerate and empower us. And so we're, uh, we're about to enter into an era that's, that's uh, really quite exciting. And so it's exciting to me to see that uh, MSOE and Dirk, Dirk's uh, building is going to house an instrument that's going to enable that discovery and that learning to happen. So I want to congratulate you again for this amazing building. It's a great honor to be here today. And if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to take it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, automation of information sharing. Okay. IT. Okay. And now we're going to automate automation. Okay. When you think through it, the brain goes crazy. Okay. Thank you. The applications are really great. Yes, sir. No, it doesn't. AI is going to AI. Uh, if you think through AI for just a second. Uh, what it's doing is this. In today's world, most people who are in the computer industry know how to program computers or configure computers. The knowledge of programming a computer is, is a high bar. It is the reason why students come to the school. For most of the world, if you're an oceanographer, a forestry major, an ag major, a biology major, it's very unlikely that programming a computer is going to be within your reach. You're trying to learn your own domain. You're an oceanographer. It's very unlikely that programming a, programming a computer is going to be something that you, you know quite well. And so today, IT, if you will, is available to a handful, a small concentration of computer scientists and computer programmers. In the future, since the computer is going to program itself, and we're going to teach it how to program itself. We're going to guide it in how to program itself. The computer scientists are still going to be essential so that we could discover new computers and new algorithms and new approaches. However, for everybody else, for the very first time, a computer will program itself, and therefore you no longer need to know how to, compute, know how to program a computer, and you can access its capabilities. AI is going to democratize computing for society. You could be a farmer and use, use AI and use a computer. One of my favorite stories is a cucumber farming family in Japan. And the kid comes home and um, I wanted to, and his family grows cucumbers. And growing cucumbers, as it turns out, is really, really hard. And the reason for that is because the market for cucumbers is, you know, depending on the quality of the cucumber, it's a factor of 10 apart. There's a normal cucumber, there's a super ugly cucumber, and then there's the perfect cucumber. Well, it turns out all of those three cucumbers come from the same plants. It comes from the same farm. And so somebody has to decide what is the perfect cucumber that you send to a sushi chef, what is the ugly cucumber that you're gonna to have to sell at a discount, and what is a normal cucumber that you could put into a store. Somebody has to sort all that stuff out. It is a human intelligence problem. No computer program could be written that looks at a cucumber and say, ah, you're ugly. <laughs> ah, you're really quite beautiful. You're normal. That algorithm is too complex for a human to write because of diversity and shapes and size and it's subjective. However, it is possible to have a software program called AI watch the mother sort through the cucumbers. The son wrote this little program. It was really, really easy to write because he didn't have to write any program at all. He just taught an AI how to do this. And the little flipper goes good, ugly, bad, so on and so forth. That piece of software would be impossible for a cucumber farmer to write. No human could write it anyways. And yet today with AI, 
that cucumber farmer could use AI technology in their farm. And it really, it, it, it accelerated their work, took the manual labor uh, from the mom so that she could spend her time marketing the cucumbers that she's growing. And so what AI has done is not, not deprive the IT industry of work, it's actually growing the number of IT engineers we need. But it's democratized computer access to everybody else. Does that make sense? Everybody's a programmer now. Yes, sir. So I chair the Wisconsin IoT Council where we work with manufacturers to help them envision who they are gonna become, their next generation of product, uh, leveraging AI Cloud and AI Edge for right now. But there's a lot of leadership within these companies that are moving very slow uh, or believe some of this to be pie in the sky. What do you say to them? They, um, I, I, I don't know why they would move slow. Um, there's, there's several reasons I think people move slow. I, um, the, first, the first reason is because they don't completely understand how to harness that technology. That's if they understood the technology. Now, the technology of AI is surprisingly easy to understand. I've explained this several times in, in the talk. It's about perception of the environment, reasoning about the circumstance, and then planning a set of actions, planning a set of actions that is congruent or in the direction of your goals. I just described the basic path of intelligence. This is how we solve all problems. Now, AI solves the problems the same way. And it's been codified into this machine learning algorithms, set of machine learning algorithms, and there's a, there are all kinds. There's some that are better at spatial, some, some that are be better at two-dimensional, some that are better at sequential information, some that are better at images, some that are better at text and language. Um, there are all kinds of AIs. And so I could imagine it being a little intimidating. But I would engage it nonetheless. I mean, the, the, thing, that, the thing that makes reinvention possible is the ability to relearn, that, that curiosity about the technology or about something new and be willing to relearn it. And we're constantly relearning. If you look at the upper left-hand corner where we started and the bottom right, uh, the work that we're doing today is, is simply <laughs> unbelievable if we would have said, would we be working on that stuff on the bottom right uh, you know, when we first started in 1993? And so that the, the, the energy and the spirit and the willingness to relearn, your, relearn and constantly uh, reinvent yourself is something that is just is a character that's essential um, for all companies, especially during discontinuities like this. And then the second thing is I would just engage it, just try it. And um, sometimes, sometimes uh, uh, you know, young people are, are uh, just much more eager to try new things, um, find some people and just, you know, in the company and go engage it. And so, so I, I think they're probably moving slowly because they either don't understand the technology, don't understand its impact, um, and don't know how to start. And uh, those, those, are all, those are all solvable problems. Uh, great presentation. Quick question about uh, some of the data protection stuff that's going on in Europe. And you, know, you, you had brought up a great point that AI kind of was incubated and in social AI, is, is that going to, some of these new data protection laws on the, on the human side, obviously it won't affect the industry side, but how will that affect AI in, in the future? There are four fundamental reasons why AI is gonna move out to the edge. And the definition of edge is it's just not in the cloud. Okay, the edge could be uh, somewhere in some country in a farm, or somewhere in some country inside a hospital, or you know, inside a warehouse. The definition of edge is simply not in the cloud. There's reason, there are several reasons why edge AI, edge intelligence, distributed intelligence, intelligence at the point of action is essential. First reason, first reason is simply the speed of light. There are many decisions that have to be made within a few milliseconds, and you can't make that decision in a few milliseconds if you have to send the information to the cloud through all these hubs, up in the cloud, do the processing, send the information back. For example, if you have a cobot, and you're working next to a, a robot, and this robot is holding something steady on your behalf, 
and doing something that you otherwise can't do. And you're working with this robot, and this robot um, I was doing something, was moving something heavy so that I could work on it. And in the process of, of moving, that's okay. In the process of moving, it's a Oh, okay. In the process of moving, uh, all of a sudden somebody got in its way. We need that robot to stop instantaneously. We can't afford the speed of light. The second, we just can't afford streaming live information continuously uh, into the cloud. When we use a phone and we ask information, we do search, it's intermittent. You know, you and I, we might, use the, might touch our computer a few hundred times a day. However, a sensor in a farm monitoring all of the crops is sending information continuously. It'll never stop. A uh, sky kilometer array will look at, the, look at the universe continuously, it'll never stop. And so you have to decide, is this information useful or not, reject it at that point. You don't want to send that in the cloud, do that processing in the cloud. Too much information, the laws of economics. The first one's the laws of physics, the second one's the laws of econo economics. The third is sovereignty. There's simply data you can't afford to send to the cloud somewhere else. You have to keep it on prem on premise. And the reason for that is privacy or you don't own it. You don't own that data and you surely wouldn't want to send it somewhere else that might be at risk of being exposed to, um, to harm. And so that's another reason. Another reason is, is uh, it takes more than one sensor. It's called sensor fusion. We perceive better when we can see and hear. And we perceive better when we can see, hear, and somehow the hair on our arms uh, you know, could feel the environment. Perception is a sensor fusion problem. And there's a whole bunch of sensor fusion challenges. Let me give you an example. In healthcare, if you want to make the proper diagnosis and recommendations, it is very likely you'll get genomics information, radiology information, your diet, your family history, how you're feeling, all of the pathology information, the blood tests, so on and so forth. All of, that's, all of that information can't reside in one place, and more likely won't. And so you need to fuse all that sensor. If you have a self-driving car, it is very likely you want to use the IMU, the inertial measurement unit, uh, how, the, how the car is moving, the radars, the cameras, and in the future, even LIDARs. And so you want to fuse all that information. It's not likely you could send all of those, all that sensor information to the cloud independently have it fused up in the cloud and perceived and send the right information back. Okay, and so you want to do that at the point of action. There's a, there's a variety of reasons, uh, but those are kind of the four fundamental pillars of them, which is the reason why I believe AI at the edge is going to be the largest of all. I believe that at the point of action intelligence is where the vast majority of the benefits of AI will be provisioned, will be, will be created, not in the cloud. Cloud is just the first step. I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so if AI is like the fourth uh, transformation thing, your automation of automation, what well, could be the next one? Because you said you guys always think about stuff in the head. Or, or if automation's yeah. the end. Yeah. Well, ho hopefully, hopefully the next one, hopefully the next one is, is um, uh, probably related to time travel. <laughs> and and um, I, <laughs> you laugh. Um, <laughs> you, di you did ask, and I'm trying to be honest. Okay, and, and so here, here, here's what's going to happen. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to create, we're going to, first we have to invent the robotics. And we're going we're to send robots, we're going to send robots um, uh, through space. And we're not going to be on it. And we're going to send, we're, we're going to send our robots on a really long journey. And on the way, it's going to keep reinventing itself. And whenever we have new ideas on how to, how to make the robots better, we'll send it to the spaceship that's traveling to another galaxy um, uh, at the speed of light. That robot will take the new information um, and then it will improve itself. Meanwhile, it's going to discover some new knowledge because it's working itself. It's going to send it back to us at the speed of light. And so, so now we have these two worlds. One is a robotic world. One is a human world. And we're sharing knowledge with each other. 
Someday, someday, so much of my consciousness is going to be essentially captured in my experiences with all of the applications and all of the machine learning algorithms that we have. Uh, hopefully, in another 30, 40 years, uh, the essence of me is, you could ask it any question, it will come back with the right answer. And so it's essentially me. And so on that day, maybe you'll send me right to the robot that is being built. Then when I get there, um, I will, I will uh, be able to see what's happening out there and uh, be on that robot. And so, so first thing, I'll be able to travel at the speed of light. The second, the second is um, if, I, if I extended that idea to uh, the, presence, the present, then it's very likely that the robots that we're creating today in virtual reality, because we create virtual realities today, um, so that we could teach a robot how to be a robot. And so our self-driving car is learning to be a self-driving car inside a virtual reality environment. Whenever it passes that test, we'll take the AI out of that car, virtual car, and put it into the physical car. Well, this virtual reality environment is going to get better and better and better all the time. Pretty soon, we will have little robots, little virtual reality robots, AI robots, and they're going, to, they're going to be working as a team inside this virtual reality environment. You and I are going to go to sleep tomorrow morning. It's going to come back. And, it, and, we're going to, and it's going to have solved a problem at the speed of light okay, um, while we're sleeping. And so the next day, we go into it in virtual reality. And, and it shows us what it's created. And if we like what it's created, we're going to bring it out into the, the real reality and, um, uh, and make our world better. Now that we're going to have these virtual worlds, uh, and, and these virtual worlds will, will be evolving um, you know, with the assistance of AI. And so the, the concept of space and time will now change. You know, you'll be able to go somewhere else at the speed of light. You'll be go able to go into another universe uh, whenever you like. Uh, and in the future, I could present this from, uh, from California, and you shouldn't be able to tell that I'm not here. And so that, that kind of... That kind of experiences are, are not uh, fantasy anymore. It's um, still on the cusp of science fiction, but I can imagine building it. And so, so uh, uh, you know, Dwight's next building uh, is going to be gigantic, um, uh, but it, it will be in virtual reality. I, I, wanna, I wanna thank all of you and I congratulate dear Jensen for an incredible talk, a thought-provoking talk. Uh, for those of you who are registered for lunch, you will be in the building next door, the German English Academy building, uh, hosted by Direct Supply. As you go out the exit, you just take to the left, it'll be the first building there, and if there are people in red shirts that will help you if you need some help. But uh, please join me in one final round of applause for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.